Welcome back, Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinny Eastwood Show, broadcasting live on AmericanFreedomRadio.com, five days a week. You know, it's December 21st, tomorrow in New Zealand, and uh, I think the rest of you guys, you've got to wait another two days. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'll be doing... I'm, 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 I'm wondering... Andy, whether or not I should do a show on the 21st, or whether or not I just want to um, uh, take that day off, um, I think I've got Zen Gardner on the show tomorrow, and you know what, I think I probably will, because it'll be, it'll be fun to actually broadcast live uh, on, on December 22nd from New Zealand to the United States when it's December 21st, the, uh, the alleged uh, and total hoax into, into the world, just go, okay guys, look. I've seen December 21st, and it ain't no different from December 20th. Well, I know that the world doesn't end because when I was serving as a child in Project Pegasus, aspects of my post-December 21st, 2012 existence were shown to me. So I haven't allowed myself to be bothered at all by sort of the conventional catastrophism that centers around that date. I I think that's irrational. I think it's sort of like the millennial fever of 1844, where you may recall that people were standing on their roofs uh, of their homes awaiting the return of Jesus Christ. I mean, there's no dispositive evidence that indicates that December 21st is going to be different than any other day. Hmm. Certainly the uh, planetary alignment of 5-5-2000 didn't result in anything manifesting. The procession of the equinox apparently happens in the year 2118, not in, not in 2012. Um, so I'm not preparing for anything beyond just another day of existence and the beginning of the future. You know, I'm preparing for a big party, Andy. And uh, if anybody's listening, if you want to email me through the contact page of the VinnieEastwoodShow.com, I'll send you my address. If you're if you're in Auckland, New Zealand uh, uh, tomorrow night, you know, come on round. Because look at it this way. If it is the end of the world, but it's not... <laughs> You'd be great that you were, that you were hacking around with other uh, conspiracy-minded people who can have really, really awesome conversations with. And on the other hand, um, isn't that just a great excuse anyway? You know, people use uh, uh, bad things as an excuse to uh, be afraid, to uh, 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 get prepared, and, and, and things like that. I see bad times as a time to uh, celebrate what you're about to lose. That's my perspective. Well, there is anyway. a psychological doubt here um, in the sense that by apprehending catastrophe, people are at least Im- at least temporarily uh, unburdened of the need to contemplate the future and, and the struggles and strains that it will inevitably entail. On the other hand, it's a poor way of motivating yourself to enjoy a better future, either personally or, or collectively. Yeah. I mean, but it I does, it does push it psychological. I mean, if your energy levels are low, push them up. If 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 your government sucks, push them out. I, I, I don't know what, what, what people have really got. You don't need a particular time or date to be a powerful, well-connected and uh, effective human being with a decent psychological profile and a big heart. You don't, you don't need a, a particular day to come. Time waits for no man. So why should any man wait for time to pass? Exactly. But, you know, uh, Vinny, sorry, Vinny, uh, moments do matter. So, for example, I'm motivating myself by envisioning the moment when I cut the red ribbon at Grand Central Teleport in New York City. So envisioning great moments that are worth living, that works. That's That's a good way to motivate yourself positively. As 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 contrasted with adhering to an arbitrary date in time that's devoid of content. That's not a moment, that's, a, that's some end state. Why would, why would you apprehend some undesired end state? That, that just doesn't make sense. Okay. Now we have, uh, we have Bernie uh, Mendez calling me. I'll just uh, send his uh, info to AFR and uh, see if he wants to uh, ring in and join us. Would you like that, Andy? Sure, I, I just mentioned to Bernie, uh, Bernie when we were on here, that's why I actually referenced him that, that I was still on with you, because I see that he had contacted me over Skype, so have at it if you'd like. Okay, okay. Well, AFR, if you can um, uh, get that contact info sorted and uh, bring Bernie up, I've sent it right to you, should be all good. 
he should be coming up uh, soon enough. Um, now, the other aspect of this is a lot of people, they'll, they'll talk about you, Andy, and, and, as if you're the only one um, who, who was part of the project and they kind of uh, blackball you, you know, do the whole ad hominem argument. You're not the only one who was there. You're not the only one talking about it. I mean, come on. You know, pe people don't uh, collectively hallucinate the exact same thing in the exact same period of time. That's correct. In fact, we have six whistleblowers five of whom were jumpers, one of whom was asked to jump with her children, and we're developing a seventh whistleblower who is a distinguished person. So basically, in order of public revelation, there was Michael C. Rell, myself, Arthur Neumann, who was the Henry Deacon informant to Project Camelot, William B. Stillings, and then Laura Eisenhower described how she was subjected to a recruitment to go to the Mars colony in 2006 and 7 with her twin boys, and then Bernard Mendez. So there's six informants telling the same story. And by the way, I've resolved with Laura that when she was being told she and her sons were going to go to Mars via ARC, I think, again, they were referring to the jump rooms, the idea being that if you wanted to relocate um, a large group of human beings in a time-urgent way on Mars, you could have people just streaming through the jump rooms. Okay, so I think the ARCs were the jump rooms themselves. That was a metaphor for saving saving humanity or a large part of the biodiversity on Earth by jump rooming uh, human beings to another planet. That bespeaks what actually the jump rooms were doing, if in fact it was a holographic uh, effect of some kind. Now, Laura and I are going to be developing a seventh whistleblower. So again, when you have these people who are roughly members of the baby boom generation in the 13thers, uh, and they had a similar set of experiences focused on the same training officers, the same locations. I mean, William Stillings, Bernard Mendez, and myself were trained together. Okay, we met in the summer of 1980 before we ever saw one of the jump rooms. That, I think, is persuasive. I mean, if you were trying to establish that somebody had served in the military and you were, you were capable of finding three testifying witnesses who were in their military unit, that could be used in any court of law in the Anglo-American jurisprudential system of justice throughout the whole world. Okay, so we have three individuals who were trained and on the surface of Mars together. We've got Michael's original account, and then we've got Arthur, and, uh, and then Laura as a member of a U.S. presidential family coming forward. Look at how infrequently the descendants of U.S. presidents ever even comment on matters of public interest. We've had what? We had Amy Carter opposing apartheid and climbing over the fence at one of the nuclear facilities. But, 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 but generally speaking, the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of U.S. presidents have avoided commenting on the affairs of the day because they don't want to be viewed as attempting to claim political currency merely as a result of the genetic accident of having been genetically descended from a U.S. president. So Laura has been exceptional as a member of the Eisenhower family in coming forward and saying, look, these guys are telling the truth because in 2006 and 7, I was asked to go to Mars with my boys to settle there. I mean, why would somebody from a presidential family tell a tale tall, excuse me, tell a, ta a, a, a tale, tale that tall? <laughs> Yeah, um, that's a bit of a tongue twister. But why would the, the, why the would tall somebody... tale tongue twisting uh, 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 triangular vernacular? Yeah, right. So why it's late in the year, but yeah. why would uh, why would Laura be telling a tall tale um, and and risk the the currency or the credibility she would have as an Eisenhower to talk about other matters of public interest? Well, it's, a good sense. it's a good question. And we we have a caller on the line here. I think it might be Bernie. Is that you, Bernie? Yes, it's me. Can you hear me over? Oh, yeah. Roger. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Bernie? Not too bad. Sorry I joined a little late. Been very busy today. Had a lot of legal issues to get by. Yeah, there just is never enough time in the day, is there? I'm and out of a job, in case anybody's interested. <laughs> Hey, all right. Well, what have we been um, uh, discussing here um, earlier in the show, Bernie, 
is um, Andrew has been laying out these uh, these different uh, possibilities about the uh, the chronovisors and the um, the grey aliens and that kind of thing, which was responsible for this um, this Mars jump um, that you guys did, where you had a bit of a repeat experience, like a deja vu, and then you refused to go on the on a following um, jump. I was wondering if yeah, if you had I'm anything to uh, to add um, onto onto that uh, gravy train there. Yes, uh, I'm here to support Andrew. Uh, Andrew kind of persuaded me to step forward and uh, a lot of reservations, losing my job being one of them now. But uh, I think he's doing a really good thing. My website's BernardMendez.com. That particular jump was what they called a loop. We, we were in some kind of loop. There were at least three jumps made. Uh, and the same thing, it repeated over and over again. And we don't know who this boy was. Uh, when I, the jump that Brett made ahead of me, they came back and then, uh, I think it was, uh, Dames called me over and said, we have a problem. Uh, someone's back there. I says, now I said, how many people jumped? He said, four people jumped and four people came back. And who's left behind? So we don't know. Apparently it was an incident where some boy got, uh, mauled by a creature. So when I made the jump right after that, uh, we didn't, we didn't see anything. It was by the ramp. We had built a ramp because the creatures can't go up the ramp. And we were testing the ramp to make sure it was going to be stable. So they had put this corrugated tin on the side of the ramp. So if the ramp started collapsing, we would notice that the corrugated tin would, you know, fall apart on the side of the ramp. So uh, uh, we, we were testing that ramp. And someplace off to the right of that ramp, down in an area on off to the right of it somehow where this uh, kid got mauled. Uh, so when I went up there, we didn't see anything. And we had I had walked up the ramp because they, they wanted me to check the ramp when I was up there to make sure it was stable. Uh, but on the way back, when we came back and we were down at the bottom of the ramp and we were walking back towards the jump room is when this boy popped out of nowhere. He turned around and he walked up the ramp. And before I could say anything, because I didn't notice him right away, he was like behind us. He slid down, went into this area, and this whole scenario happened over again, just about the same fashion. Uh, we never identified exactly who he was. So I said, this happened. From, what, from the briefing I got before that, it seemed to have happened exactly the same way. Uh, so what I said, before we go down there and do anything, Let's jump back and let's get some more help here and find out what the hell's going on because he wasn't part of our group that we, as we jumped there. So when I went back, I, you know, I told the per personnel that were there, I said, the same thing happened. This boy slid down the side of the uh, ramp and he got mauled by one of these creatures. He's running around in a particular manner, a manner we were trained to run in like semicircles because the creatures couldn't turn around very easily. And, uh, uh, apparently he got mauled uh, again, and I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, who is this person that's up there? So the amount of people that jumped with me and jumped back were the same. So this additional person, wherever he was, and I never have been able to identify who he was, and this thing happened again. So, and then from there, I, uh, we were all standing around discussing all this, and I said, well, this happened to you, this happened to you, and... There were names being dropped as to who this person was, but this person wasn't in the wasn't in the program, so I really didn't know what to do. Um, so I think I left the area at that time. But I think another jump was made after that, and I think the same thing happened again. Now, uh, when I came back and because I have, I went over and and I was talking to someone else, I had a procedure I had to follow. And when I came back and we everyone was sitting around with, with, with mulling around trying to figure out what the hell was going on. Uh, Another jump was made, and apparently the same identical thing happened again. I said, make sure you count the people that leave and the people that come back. You know who left and who came back. The exact number of people who left came back. And apparently it happened again. Andrew, what do you think? I think you've given a, a description that pretty much follows mine. I, I know that I was in the front of the group, and immediately behind me was Courtney Maurice Hunt of the CIA, and then my dad and I was keeping a close eye on my dad because of his cardiac and pulmonary issues. And then I know you were toward the back of our original or sort of authentic cadre, 
Wasn't Brett on that jump as well? I kind of remember Brett being there, but maybe I've superimposed that because Brett was rather youthful and, and similar in nature to the blonde boy who then appeared. But there was also that woman who who was sort of a Christer. I mean, she was always sort of dropping Jesus' name in every other sentence. It would, now, was she a member of our group? Because I didn't recognize her. Wasn't she another sort of holographic augmentation of our original our original uh, cadre that was on that sortie on, on the surface? Uh, that woman <clears throat> was a person, and I, I had reservations before we made the jump. I said, uh, they were sitting over having coffee, and I said, uh, let's go get briefed about the last few jumps and this is where we're going. I knew where we were going anyway. But I said, let's get, I always have the procedure. We're going to have a brief and debrief. And then we'll, we'll talk about the jump. Is any problems? You know, anything that we have to uh, worry about? And then she was sitting there at the table. Says, we're going to sit here and we're going to pray. So I says, you know, this is not our procedure. Okay. Hey, Bernie, we're coming to break here. Um, <clears throat> did you want to hang on um, over the over the break, or are you, you're all good, mate? I'll, I'll hang here. All right. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Bernard Mendez and Andrew Bashango. Back, ladies and gentlemen. Final segment here on the Vinnie Eastwood Show, the fastest two hours in talk radio. It's the lighter side of genocide because in a world so full of chaos and madness, if you lose your sense of humour, you'll go friggin' nuts. It's for freaking sure, mate. And uh, we have Bernard Mendez, UFOQA.com, and I believe also uh, BernardMendez.com, and Andrew Bashago from Project Pegasus.net. Gentlemen, welcome back. I don't know where we're going to go with this. We've got one final segment, and uh, when each of you start speaking, it tends to take up two hours. So <laughs> what what exactly can we squeeze in that's of uh, great importance to either of you? Well, I think it's significant, Vinny, that we've got three five, individuals five, four, zero, one, five, six, and living in different parts of the country. I mean, I live in Washington State where I practice law. Um, Brett... Um, is an inventor and computer specialist residing in Southern California, and Bernard Mendez lives in New York City, that we're from different backgrounds, but we're adhering to our, our claim that we worked together in, in this secret defense project 30 years ago, and that we're now in communication and have become not just colleagues, but friends now, and um, we're standing by each other's accounts because the people have a right to know the different forms of space exploration that the United States government has conducted, and they include different forays in time space embodied in different time travel technologies. And this was a project that was undertaken in furtherance of the NASA Act. You know, the original enabling legislation for the U.S. Space Agency in 1958 stated that the primary goal of the space agency was the expansion of human knowledge of space and the near-earth environment. Well, this is exactly what this was. We were either going to the actual Mars holographically, or we were accessing a synthetic quantum environment that must have been in space rather than under or on the surface of the ground uh, of the Earth in, in terms of the SQE concept, because we were in frequently in the jump room for 20 minutes. Um, and, you know, I really am grateful to Bernard and William for coming forward because I was really out uh, on my own in terms of talking about Project Pegasus because when I was serving as a child in Project Pegasus, most of the people that I was interacting with were mid-career professionals, roughly 45 to 65 years of age, including some of the Manhattan Project physicists. Well, so almost all of the adult participants in Project Pegasus are, are either deceased or very elderly. But in the case of the Jump Room program, which was 10 years later in the early 80s, we have three adults who not only served together, but were trained together. And we remain in solidarity over the fact that the program existed and that it involved a time travel technology and that we were part of it. So. I think it's a story that's not going to go away when you also factor in that during the entire time that Barack Obama has been president and there's been this sort of superficial controversy about whether he was born in Kenya or Hawaii, the truth of this particular man is that he was a participant in a secret space program project 
that took he and us off planet. And I think that's part of the history of our time that needs to be told. And look, now that President Obama has been reelected, I'm going to continue to speak as openly and truthfully and as often as I can to link him to the program, not really to focus on him, because after all, he was just another jumper who went on to an illustrious uh, career, as, as a number of us did. Um, so it wasn't all about Barack Obama, but the fact that he served in the, in, in the secret space program is part of the history of the U.S. presidency and the times that we're living in. And so the story is simply not going to go away. Bernie, anything to add? Um, I, I believe that I didn't, first of all, when Andrew first talked to me, and Andrew was the only one talking to me, at least five or six other people had talked to me, and I requested access to the uh, information which had been, some of it's been declassified and then reworked and reclassified. Uh, you know, I had reservations about it all, but I didn't ever believe in my lifetime, because I was told never to talk about it, that these matters would ever come to light. And apparently, there's more and more witnesses in the wings. Even George Knapp is uh, 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 starting to get suspicious that maybe there's something really to this. Even our critics are, are being silenced. Uh, this is a, a, a very big affair. Should it continue, continue at this pace to prove out, which uh, someday it will. I know that for a fact. What will in my lifetime? That's another story. But uh, I don't know if you want to continue with the different jumps and what had happened, or you just want to continue with talking about the project in general. What you do prefer? You know, I'm, for me, there's there's also a, a philosophical aspect to this because it's it's not just a a, a technical thing. Uh, that was being done uh, during these experiments. Have have you guys learned any kind of uh, lessons about maybe life or the the nature of uh, reality itself um, that are, that are really quite profound by this experience? You want to go first, Andrew? Or should I go yeah, first? Well, you know, we were brainwashed after our training in the summer of eighty, and then before our last jump in nineteen eighty four. So one of the things. One of the philosophical dimensions of this kind of experience, perhaps one of just the cognitive things, let me start there, is that when you have a life experience that is singular or very, very stressful, even traumatic, and the trauma is reinforced by the kind of brainwashing that was available, let's say, from the Reagan years forward, which was already going on 20 years after MK Ultra ended, you can compartmentalize life experience so that you simply do not revisit it in your mind for decades. Now that didn't happen to me with my childhood experiences in Project Pegasus because when they were inducing this hideous headache and speaking to me in a mesmerizing voice in spring of 72 or end of summer of 72 to try to get me to repress, to basically suppress my memories of Pegasus, that didn't work. And I was periodically mentioning something about Pegasus to my junior high, high school, college, and, and graduate and law school classmates and friends. And that's why I was really focusing on my experiences in Pegasus when I began going back and revisiting my non-ordinary experiences roughly from around the year 2000. But in the case of the Jump Room program, if Brett hadn't evinced the personal courage to contact me, and then if our dialogue had not been augmented and improved by Bernie stepping forward and communicating with us, a lot of this information would have remained trapped in areas of our minds that were not accessible to ourselves. So I think it's safe to say that it's, 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 there's, it's relatively easy to suppress the memory of a single person, but it's far more difficult to suppress the memories of a group of people who ex experienced things in common, who shared common experience. And, and so because memory is so fickle and so ineffective, since memory is so imperfect, I think that in society in general, but certainly in the, the counterculture, if you will, the, the cultural creative demographic where we explore these kind of issues, we have to exercise what I'm basically describing simply as the principle of tolerance. Because look, everybody's experience is germane only to them. And we don't even understand at this point whether the, un the universe exists and we perceive it, 
or the universe exists because we perceive it, which is, the, of course, the Einstein-Heisenberg dilemma. So what I'm saying here is, if somebody like myself, who's a, a hard-headed realist, I'm a trial lawyer, um, I earned degrees from universities as distinguished as UCLA and Cambridge, I have been screened psychologically to, to, to be admitted to, to, to numerous state bar examinations, um, I have no arrest record, no history of drug or alcohol abuse, if, and, and Bernie's a similar personality. We're very hard-boiled, realistic personalities. If we could come forward and allege this set of facts, then we have to practice a principle of toleration, of open-mindedness. Because even in the lives of hard, hard-boiled public servants like ourselves, this information was not easy for us to extract from where it existed in our minds as a result of the original non-ordinary nature of the experiences, the trauma, and the brainwashing that was done against us. So well, here's another that, element that, that I was just thinking about yesterday, Andrew, is that uh, people say, oh, show me the evidence, show me the evidence. If somebody is on trial and they testify that, yes, I saw that criminal breaking into that car and it looks exactly like this person in the courtroom here, yes. testimony is evidence well well actually to, to amplify or clarify individuals are free to testify directly in live testimony as or or uh in, in a written form subject to an attestation of their oath that they're telling the truth but witnesses can testify in direct in live testimony as to what they what they did or what they saw and that is direct evidence in fact probably at least 50% of the evidence that's used to convict people of crimes is such live testimony embodying direct evidence of some witness or participant. I saw that man over across in the courtroom robbing the bank. Um, yes, yeah, so for example, and that knocks down the frequent phony or fallacious argument that when you're alleging non ordinary facts, you're engaging in hearsay. I mean, hearsay is an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. It's a statement of a statement that's been made. It's not direct testimony of that which was received. That's sort of... So yes, personal accounts are admissible as direct evidence. Yeah, all right. And and we've got Bernard Mendez, Andrew Brashago. Gentlemen, welcome <laughs> to the Funny Eastwood Show. I don't know why I said welcome. Just very, very tired. Didn't have a whole lot, a whole lot of sleep. And you know, I, I gotta, I got to say this. If, if people are really testifying, like really, first-hand accounts, witness evidence, things like that, it doesn't matter how insane the story sounds. You've got to listen to them and take them as if it were a piece of physical evidence like DNA or any other kind of evidence. It has virtually the same value. And if people are corroborating, people are saying the same things, it's got to be true. We'll see you again sometime, ladies and gentlemen. No matter where you live. Globalism affects you. Did you know that the Vinnie Eastwood Show has more subscribers than New Zealand Herald TV and is New Zealand's most popular YouTube news channel? Where warm hearted humour and a list of awesome guests talk about crucial issues which the mainstream media ignore. A show where you, the listener, can phone up with questions, comments, and suggestions of guests. Vinnie is building a hub to connect truthers with raw information they need to become active. He can help you gain further skills such as website building, producing audio and video, and creating revenue streams in your own multimedia environment. Because Vinny supports such a wide range of people in the truth movement, he is not government or corporate backed and relies entirely on your donations. Give now, give generously, or subscribe for $10 a month for access to ad-free video archives. Just visit the VinnieEastwoodShow.com and click donate. If you take an active interest in maintaining the optimum health and well-being of yourself and your family, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is the magazine you've been waiting for. Having taken Australia and New Zealand by storm, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is now available in the UK and Europe. Visit www.nznaturalmed.co.uk or call 01626 337-531 to order your copy now.
Do you realise every day we are being put under constant stress from wireless radiation? What's worse is that you don't even know that it's happening. It puts as much stress on our body as if we had a constant viral infection, draining our energy and sapping our strength, or just making us irritable and fatigued. These wireless fields are being emitted from computers, microwaves, mobile phones, power lines, and any electrical appliance. Now there is a solution. A group of research engineers in New Zealand have come up with an active shielding device that shields you from wireless radiation at a cellular level. Blue Shield comes in three models, a household, portable, and USB that plugs into any computer. The great thing about Blue Shield is it is very affordable and guaranteed to last. A one-off purchase will see you being protected for years to come. Visit AmericanFreedomRadio.com and click on the Blue Shield banner. Blue Shield, brought to you by the Vinnie Eastwood Show.com. Thank you.